Sean Spicer is a multi-award winning guitarist and only one of the few faith-based guitarists ever to be featured in Guitar Player magazine. Many admirers of his style refer to him as a guitar player's guitarist, and he is one of the most melodic, heartfelt guitar players in the Christian industry. Well, Sean Spicer has won six GMA awards and was nominated as 2022 Instrumental Artist of the Year for GMA Canada Covenant Awards. And he also toured the music for the movie The Identical, starring the late Ray Liotta and Ashley Judd in 2013 and 2014. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the guitar player's guitarist, the multi-award winning gentleman himself, Sean Spicer. Welcome to the show. Hello, sir. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. So, hey, right off the bat, what made you want to be a musician? I think it was the ability to express myself. I think music is a wonderful um, means of communication. It's a very healthy and positive outlet. It's nothing like picking up an instrument and just being able to play and just let out all your feelings. I think the best way if someone had to do my eulogy when I pass one day is that they listen to my the music that I've done or played on. I think that would say more than anything that words would say. Well, you know, I've listened to your past album, Olive Tree, and I kept listening to all of the songs, all of the tracks, and you have a little bit of, uh, maybe a little bit of Phil Kegginess there in that playing. Um, it's very beautiful, and one of my favorite songs on that actual album, Olive Tree, is Grace. I absolutely love just the way it flows. It's very soothing. Uh, beautiful song. Thank you. Yeah, Phil Keggy was an influence of mine, and that's a huge compliment even to be uh, um, compared to him, and even in the smallest way. He's a pure genius, everything he's done from Glass Harp to his solo stuff, so thank you. Well, what is it about your music that makes you feel so passionate? Um, because it, it just comes from a place within. You know, it, it starts, of course, the practical with riffs and chords and notes, and then it just takes on its own life for me. It depends on, you know, the place that I'm in or the people I'm working with, and that inspires me on every level. Well, what are other uh, types of guitarists have you played with, and what kind of advice have you learned from them? Uh, many different things. I've always been... Um, a student I'm always learning I think I've just scratched the surface and one that I mentioned earlier when we were setting up was was Steve I he had this I was a big fan of his in the 80s and I had his solo records and uh, about a little over 10 years ago he had a clinic called alien guitar secrets and he just sat there and taught about the music business and and setting goals and it was pure genius I took in everything he did I did notes and I watched things just change for me well, you know, learning from someone like Steve, because I've interviewed Steve I twice already, and fantastic guy, uh, and I know a lot of guitar players always want to focus and learn, let's say, uh, what he has to say about technique, about practice, uh, but you brought up the fact that he also talked about the music business. How important was that for you to learn? It is because I think in order to be successful, you have to understand the music business and it's not just about playing, it's about networking, it's about marketing, it's about coexisting with other people, connecting with other people. So the playing part is just one aspect of it. And um, when I've done, I think, good things, I've really connected with other people, like Tom Curlander has been a dear friend of mine, and we've played together for over 10 years. Uh, we've done some good stuff. He's, he was an actor, uh, filmmaker, songwriter. And we've done some great stuff together because there was a connection and he just wrote very heartfelt lyrics and songs. And I've been with him for 10 years. So um, it's about that connection with people. Well, yeah. And well, let me ask you this, Sean, because, you know, I know a lot of people who play guitar. Um, you know, some of the best guitarists in the world are not famous. They're not household names. Uh, how difficult is it to be a, a guitarist, one that desires to be in the music business, either someone like you being more of an instrumentalist, uh, those that are session players, and those that want to be rocking the big stage. How hard is it to get into the business now? 
Um, it's difficult, but I think if people really follow just like a true path and motive, and if people get this concept, hey, I want to be famous or rich, I, I, I don't think that's going to turn out well. But when people really do it for the right reasons, you know, I just want to express myself and I want to be creative. And that's how I look at it. If I put out a good piece of music and someone enjoys it and they put it out on SoundCloud and it touches someone, that's wonderful. That's well, what it's about. I think about the artist Van Gogh. He sold one painting in his life, one painting. And he did all this incredible work and he's a household name when it comes to that genre. So it's really about just being honest with yourself. Well, you know, how has, have you been taking use of social media uh, and, and playing uh, using those platforms to get your music out? Because I know a lot of guitarists, uh, big and small, uh, are using social media to their absolute advantage to get their music noticed and heard. Yeah, I've used it. I've got uh, SoundCloud. I got stuff on Spotify. I've got the Instagram uh, account, and um, that is all good. I, I think it's really good also to get out there and meet people. If you go out to to clubs and and things like that and coffee houses, especially when I was in Nashville, uh, the big thing about Nashville was just getting out there and networking with people and going out to a coffee house. And I connected with one of your former guests, Judy, Judy Pastor, her and I did some stuff. In fact, we did a song that won an award. Um, I think it was Jazz Blues Song of the Year, GMA, a few years back. So we did coffee houses and she's a wonderful songwriter. So I think social media is important, but I think getting out there and meeting people one on one is very good, too. Yeah, and I think Nashville is probably the best music community in the country. All I hear from other recording artists is how wonderful the community is in Nashville about getting together. Uh, you know, there may be competition here and there, but everybody wants to work together. Everybody wants to, to help each other, write songs together. Uh, the young ones coming up are learning from the veterans and so forth. Uh, to me, that's why so many people step off the bus in Nashville, because that's the place to be if you're going to be a musician or a singer songwriter. I agree. Not only is it probably the best place in the country, I would say it's the best place in the world. And you, you can't go there with an ego because there's the guy writing you a parking ticket or your waiter's better than you. So <laughs> it, I, I, that's the truth. It's a phenomenal place to learn. I did it. You get off a tour bus the next day, someone's waiting tables. I, I mean, I did that. You know, I was delivering food there the next day after I got off the tour bus. So it's just a wonderful community. People help each other. And uh, I can't say enough good things about it. Well, what kind of good advice do you have for those that are musicians, those that are songwriters, uh, having to work side jobs and doing their gigs at night or doing their gigs on the weekend? How can they keep their momentum and their passion going? I think it's just really just to enjoy what you're doing. And uh, I think... Don't set your expectations just too high. Just enjoy what you're doing. Like when I write music or play music, I just enjoy it. I enjoy the moment. Hey, if something happens, great. If it doesn't, I've still done this. It's still an experience. And I look back on some of the experiences I've had when I played the, the Troubadour in LA or when we um, toured the music for the Identical or some of the television performances. I just, I, I enjoyed it all. Um, you know, I think someone once said happiness depends on how you set your expectations. Well, yeah, that, that would make sense. And, uh, you know, I, I talked to so many recording artists and it's amazing how each and every single one of them have a different outlook when it comes to their career. Uh, some people have great management. Some people have no management at all. Uh, some have publicists and some of them don't. Uh, and I guess it just depends on what level that they're at. And I've seen recording artists that have millions upon millions of uh, streams on, let's say, Spotify, for example, and they're still not a household name. Yeah, the music industry has changed drastically over the last few decades or maybe the last generation, you know, with social media. And it, it's not structured the way it was. So you can get your name out there, but there's maybe more competition and there's not the, I guess, the record industry to fund people, but it, it's a, it's a give and take kind of thing. It, it's got pros and cons. So more yeah. music, 
out there and it's accessible by more people, but then there's not record companies that have lots of money to push things and it is what it is, but it's still good. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was funny because even uh, yesterday I was reading an article where Bob Dylan stated that he believes that uh, it's just too easy now when it comes to the music industry. Um, I, and in a way, I can understand what he's talking about, uh, but there are, I think the difficulties are even just as big now as they were back in the day before streaming, uh, before social media where, you know, people were sending demos and trying to get a record contract. So I, I guess he feels that uh, life should be a little bit more difficult if you're trying to be an artist. What say you? Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. But it's also accessible to hear bands you never would. I mean, even just this morning, I discovered a band on Spotify called Plastic Picnic, and they're coming to my town in Cleveland, and they're, they sound great. I'm going to go see them in January. So with Spotify, you can sift through things and find what you like. And, you know, I really respect and admire some of these indie rock bands who it's just about the art and getting out there and doing it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, I understand that you are one of the very, very few uh, faith-based guitarists that ended up in Guitar Player Magazine. How did that happen? I think that was just all the right things happening at the right time. I had won three GMA awards. I was signed to Pity uh, City of Peace Records. And uh, I had got on the tour with the identical movie that the record company had made this wonderful film featuring Ray Liotta and Ashley Judd. And um, it all came together at that point. Things were just kind of all moving at the right direction. Everything was falling into place. And they were looking at the time, um, the publisher, I think it was Mike Melinda, was looking for someone to do faith-based. He'd never had anyone at the time. They'd probably done people since, but he was looking for someone and I had reached out to him and said, I'm doing this movie and, and we connected on it. And it was just a good thing. Well, and that, and especially being in Guitar Player Magazine, it's just fantastic exposure. And I think it's still one of the few magazines people actually read today. It is. It's a great magazine. I remember reading it as a kid and I still read it. It's just so many good articles and, and so many good things there. Yeah. And that's what I love about the, uh, the guitar community. It's very tight. Uh, so many people are willing to learn. And I think in a way, and, and I want your thoughts on this. When the pandemic hit, I think for a lot of people, I think it jump-started the guitar industry because the guitar industry was battling uh, head-on with the gaming in industry. You know, you got a lot of kids sitting there playing video games, but they're not learning a musical instrument. But then when the pandemic hit, I think people were looking for different things to do. And yeah. more people start picking up the guitar. So what do you think? Yes, that's true. And, and among other that, a lot of these artists who weren't touring and locked up wrote wonderful music. And a lot of this albums, these albums came out like they were locked up for a year and a half or whatever it was. They wrote music and all of a sudden all this uh, tidal wave of good music started coming out. I mean, for me, I was living in New York State at the time and we had strict lockdown, so there was nothing to do. So I kind of became a fan of music again. I started... Uh, listening to old blue note jazz like Thelonious Monk and Lee Morgan, this this obscure kind of blue note jazz. These guys were like in clubs. And I thought this is. I fell in love with the concept of music again, and I was a fan and a listener. Yeah. Do of you course, think? Well, Sean, do you think the quiet time that the pandemic allowed everybody to have? Um, do you think that uh, helped people to, especially musicians? singers, songwriters, guitarists like yourself, to just have that time of no distraction per se and really hone in and focus on your craft? Yes, I think the pandemic did a, a remarkable job of helping people refocus on what's important. I really do. And yeah. I was one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in more ways than one. But you know what's funny is, you're right. There was a flood and there has been a continued flood of brand new music that has been coming out, especially all year long. Um, even uh, I came across uh, on Facebook, um, friends with Michael Sweet of Striper, 
And I was shocked that he came out and said that, you know, they were getting ready for a tour, but they had to stop the tour because there were no tour buses available because everybody jumped on the road to tour to try to make up for all the losses they had for the last two years. Yeah. And in a way, that was a good thing because now, and at the same time, all of the venues for all of the artists have been selling out like crazy. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. My wife and I, we have seen a plethora of bands and bands I've wanted to see forever. Like we saw Duran Duran in, in Phoenix and all these bands we've wanted to see for, for quite a long time. Yeah, and uh, let me ask you this because uh, some of your favorite guitarists happen to be Alex Lifeson, Andy Summers, and even Alan Holsworth. That's a pretty good mixture there. Yeah, it, it is. It was also the time when I was growing up and uh, stuff that I was being um, exposed to by people like a, 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 high, a, a schoolhood friend, Rod Snow, gave me the Moving Pictures album um, or, or introduced me to it. And that was the end of it for me, listening to, to Rush. And then I started jamming with other musicians in my youth and got into the police. And of course, when I was younger, hanging out with the guitar players and learning from each other, a guy put on Alan Holdsworth. IOU records, so that just opened all these doors. But it didn't stop there for me. I got into jazz and I got into Latin music and fusion and so many different things and indie rock. And to me, I just look at the whole scope of it. My playing, I'm a very eclectic player. I say if you had to identify me, I'm more like a maybe like a Steve Hackett. My playing is very eclectic. So when you hear my instrumental stuff, it's got a certain, that's kind of like my own musical Disneyland where I can do whatever I want. And then you hear session stuff that I've done with other people and it's very pop orientated and very regimented and controlled. So there's different sides to me. You know, I was surprised that one of your influences was Andy Summers. I rarely ever hear that. I mean, what is it about his particular playing that you really liked? Um, the very first gig I did in the church basement in the eighties, probably earlier mid eighties, maybe 84, 85, I had to do, um, message in a bottle and the drummer I was playing with the next door neighbor, he was huge into the police and listening to this guy who he was a very eclectic player. He had a jazz influence, but he was into punk and he was into new wave. He was into pop. He just had so many different, uh, um, influences to draw from so he was huge on me in the way he played and the use of effects but he did it in a kind of a pop context so i've all i've got tons of his um solo records they've inspired me so he's been huge on me and i saw the police back in 2007 i've always been a huge admirer of, of andy summers yeah i saw the police twice i believe it was 1982 in 1983 and um and, and of course with the 80s i mean it was just monster hits one right after the other but for you kind of describe to us your creative process when you write new music when i write new music i it's got like i when i was a kid and i went through that stage of learning um cover songs and being in cover bands and that's a great foundation. But then I started to get restless and want to do my own identity. I used to have like a little tape recorder. And if I had a guitar riff, I would record it. And on cassette tape, and even when I did Olive Tree, we uh, we needed, we were short. We wanted to put another song in there because it, uh, we wanted to make the album a statement that it was kind of a jazzy record. And the record exec, Jochen and Marcelino, and he was also the producer, he said, we need another song. So I went back to a cassette that I had in high school of a riff I wrote. And that was on there. And I, I that had sat there for decades. So I've always got these riffs and ideas that sit around. And sometimes they do nothing until I meet another artist that just inspires me. Like, for instance, when I did this song, I'm so proud of a song for Cliff when my father-in-law passed, my wife and I collaborated. And that was one of the greatest things. She helped me with it. And it's very jazzy because he was a huge jazz nut. He loved jazz. And we used to text each other. Uh, have you heard this artist? Have you heard Charlie Mingus? Have you heard this? And he would text back and no, have you heard that? And when he passed, that song was a dedication to him. And my wife helped me put it together. And she played percussion 
on it. And it was, um, I think, a very good reflection of who he was. So it, it starts out with riffs, but then it's, it kind of takes a life on its own when I connect with other people and there's a thought or a theme behind it and I can push that forward. You know, the reason we did sax on that record because he used to play sax. So we got one of the best sax players, I think in Nashville, Tyler Summers. Tyler has played with Stephen uh, Perry, Meatloaf, he is just brilliant. And uh, he played on that track and the producer was equally brilliant, Dave Tuff. I love that guy to death. He is just a genius and engineer as well. So we went down last year and did that. And that's kind of the start of the new record that I'm working on. And I don't know where it's going to go. It could be a full blown jazz record or it could be fusion or it could be, I don't know, you know, we well, just, you, see could, you could always for- mesh them together. I mean, it, it's, uh, and, and I love the thought processes behind songwriters. Uh, I just recently interviewed, um, uh, Joachim Horsley, who is considered a world-renowned pianist, but he meshed Caribbean music with classical, but it really turned out to be this very upbeat fusion record. And because of his background, I was surprised that he was he ended up writing a record that ended up creating its own genre. So here you have this Caribbean beat, you have this this classical trained pianist, but bringing forth fusion. And to me, I think we need more colorful songwriting, especially in the areas of music, not just songs with words, but just the music alone needs to be a little bit more colorful today than ever before. Yes, it does. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm thinking that uh, some of the songs, and I'm not trying to say that a lot of the songs on the radio are boring, but I would say a lot of the songwriting on the radio today is very poor writing and uh, very manufactured, especially when you look at the credits and you see 30 producers on one song and nobody lifted a finger to write that song. Yeah, we we don't have too many Lennon and McCartney's anymore or or Paul Simon's or James Taylor or John Denver's. I mean, I think uh, when you want to look at really good songwriting, look at look at the folk genre. I mean, those guys had nothing to hide behind. No, and they write, and they, and and in the folk genre, they literally write their own songs. And what a lot of people don't realize, and this can be a shock to a normal listener, most of country music, those songs are not written by the artist who sings them. Yeah. They're, They're written by other people, and they sit there and go through a catalog and catalog of songs trying to find. 10 or 12 songs for their next album. And those songs could have been written 10 years ago. Yeah, that's true. There's so many good songwriters in Nashville. Yeah. And so do you, I mean, I love the fact that, and I think with guitar players, especially let's say kids, teenagers, you know, playing cover songs is something that everybody does. They, they walk into a guitar store and they, they pick out a guitar and they start playing the, the, the best riff they know how to play. But to me, that just creates more interest. And, you know, here you are. You brought up the, brought up the fact that you were playing covers. Um, and let me say this. When you were playing covers, uh, were you trying to, was it expanding your mind to eventually flip that switch of writing your own stuff? It, it, it was. I always drew... Uh drew from that. I mean, I did play in tribute bands and things like that, but I've always, you know, wanted to take it a step further. So if I was like Andy Summers, like I mentioned, because he had such exotic chords, I would take that chord and I could put that somewhere in my own stuff or that certain scale, you know? So I'd always try to take things and and make it my own. Yeah. And it, it just simply makes sense. And ladies and gentlemen, hey, it, you know, and, and Sean, I've always told my viewers and my listeners, you know, especially with parents, get your kid to start playing a musical instrument. Find out what they would like to play because it is the, not all, you know, research has shown playing a musical instrument actually improves their grades overall, but it also uh, greatly improves memory and uh, hand and eye coordination all at the same time so to me either play guitar or play piano and for some if you want to play drums 
go for it. But Sean, tell us about your favorite performance in your career. Well, that's that's a tough one. There's a lot of them that have had high uh, high moments. I think playing the troubadour in Los Angeles when we showcased the identical movie. You know, I was it was a smaller club, and it had um, uh, just a a presence about it. You know, like the Eagles had played there, the Doors, uh, Guns and Roses, Linda Ronstadt, and we had showcased there. And the guy told me a story. He said he said, "You see that booth over there? John Lennon was thrown out with Harry Chapman when he was acting up." back in 75 or something like that so we sh that there's even a youtube video out there of us playing at the the troubadour so that was kind of nice um some of the stuff i've done with friend tom curlander we played um the bitter end in new york city in manhattan that was a club that bob dylan did we did a remarkable show there uh and we we've done a few others like at the grog shop in cleveland and we toured the music for his uh, album, Sugar Burn Sessions, which is a brilliant album from beginning to end. Uh, if you don't know who Tom Curlander was, he was in the movie Young Guns with Bon Jovi and Emilio Estevez. He was in uh, Kindergarten Cop. He was an actor back in the early 90s. And then he branched out as a songwriter and a filmmaker. And we've been together for about 10 years. So we've done some really good things. But I think the one of the, the best things um, performance I think I did is just the latest thing I did for my father-in-law because that I did it with my wife and it was just a, um, a piece to kind of express our love and our gratitude to our father-in-law Cliff Berry who passed and his love for jazz so that wasn't a um, performance as you would say in a public setting but I mean just that when I played that there was so much passion and so much that went into that song and uh, I would say that would be probably be the highlight on a non-stage uh, thing. Well, you know, I think the best songs out there actually come from real life experiences. And uh, the song that you wrote for Cliff is one of those songs. And it's a beautiful song. Yeah, it, it is. It, it's, uh, I think it, it'll stand the test of time. And I think people that knew him, um, you know, it, it, uh, it does reflect a lot of his, his personality. Like I say, he loved jazz and he even played sax for a little bit and you know oh yeah well tell us what is next for sean spicer in 2023 i'm uh, enjoying right now i've been teaching at the school of rock in cleveland and like you mentioned kids who learn an instrument being able to pour back into them it's a wonderful institution i mean it teaches kids to get up and perform and focus on an instrument and express themselves so i've been teaching there for a bit i there's a group of people I would love to work with, like Mike Dayo. I have a dear friend, uh, John Paredes in Pittsburgh, who's a great pianist and musician. I'd like to do more stuff with my wife. Um, like she plays percussion. We've done, you know, this song and other things. Uh, I would love to do something with Rick Heil from Sonic Flood. I've always been a deep admirer of him and his, uh, who he is and his songwriting and what he does. So, and I'm working slowly but surely on my my own stuff so right now i'm kind of in a place to see you know what what kind of comes up i just relocated from the new york area to cleveland and getting to know people there so i'm open to just about anything well where can all of my viewers and listeners find out more about sean spicer uh you could look me up on spotify or soundcloud and i have an instagram account which I, I post stuff there and it's all artistic stuff and things like that. Sean L. Spicer, I believe it is on Instagram. Yeah, yeah Mr. Sean L. Spicer yes. on Instagram. <laughs> I know where your handle is. Yes. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, you have to check it. Here's what I want you to do. If you want to hear some beautiful music by one of the best guitarists around, Sean Spicer, you can look him up on Spotify. Look up the album, uh, Olive Tree. I believe there's another album. Is, is it called The Rose of Sharon? Is, is that a song or is that an album? That's a song, and the album was Reflections of You. That was an, uh, an album I did many 16 years ago, 2006. Yeah, and then there's that one I did on SoundCloud that was kind of just released on SoundCloud um, that had a group of songs. So, and then there's the new one I'm working on that I've got pieces put together and I'm going to be in a recording studio again. So. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you need to check out Sean Spicer, especially 
on Spotify. Uh, ch literally, check out his album, Olive Tree, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And look him up on Instagram at Mr. Sean L. Spicer is right there at the bottom of your screen. And Sean, I want to thank you so much time for coming on the program today. Yes, thank you, Ward. It's been a great pleasure. And many blessings to you. And uh, I expect uh, to, to see you have a, a fantastic 2023. Thank you. You too, sir. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back with more. <laughs> 